Are we live? Should be live. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the meeting of the Wareham School Committee. Today is Thursday, February 11th, 2021. Uh, we are conducting this meeting um, on Zoom. So, um, and also the meeting is being recorded and broadcast by WCTV. All votes because we're remote will be um, roll call votes. I'd just like to confirm that uh, the school committee is present. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing everyone on my screen. So I guess we'll, do, we'll just do a roll call. Um, Kevin? Yeah. Mike? I don't see Mike. Um, Mary? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. April? Yep, I'm here. Okay, so let's call out Mike. When I, Mike, I see you on the list. He's there, he's just trying to connect. Is he? Okay. Okay, so we'll go ahead. The first item on the agenda is public participation. Um, so I will just ask if anyone would like to speak to go ahead and put it in the chat so I can recognize you. Okay, Bridget Kearns. Bridget, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've been trying to, I've been struggling with trying to understand why Wareham continues to be at two half days of in-person learning time um, per week. Um, as I was thinking about it, struggling with, you know, seven hours a week, comes out to 28 hours a month. When I look at the towns around us, they're closer to 60 hours a month. We're about at half what other towns around us are doing. I tried poking around um, the state and could find only very few towns that were um, giving as little in-person instruction as Wareham was. So we really are at the bottom of the barrel in terms of how many hours we're getting. Um, I tried reaching out to some of the school committee members. I came to a meeting a couple weeks ago and really I got a, some responses that were really like, we are trying, we're working on it. Just some of the niceties of um, we're trying. We want to see the kids. Everybody wants to see kids back in school, but I'm not understanding why Wareham is not back in school more hours, at least on par with the surrounding communities. So I called Dr. Shaverhood to see if maybe she could give me some insight into what the logistical barriers were for Wareham returning to, or at least coming up to par um, with the number of hours that we're seeing in the, in the surrounding communities. If anybody's ever talked to Dr. Shaverhood, you'll know she's very good at um, giving a lot of answers that don't really add clarity. So unless you're prepared to really push for some answers, you don't really um, get. And I'm going to paraphrase here. I don't want to put any words in her mouth, but I got, yes, we're actively working on it. We'd like to see it soon. We're hoping to add Wednesdays, but nothing concrete really came out of my conversation until I started really um, pushing a little bit harder. And the two things that I was able to determine from that conversation was that the barrier to Wednesdays in returning to Wednesdays is that there's a memorandum of agreement with the teachers union that Wednesdays is dedicated to cleaning. Um, I'm not sure why the school needs to be cleaned in such a manner that we can't return to school without having cleaning done for an entire day. It doesn't quite make sense to me, um, but this is where we're at. So from what I understand, am I misrepresenting what you told me, Dr. Shaverhood? No. Okay. So Wednesday's barrier was that we, where there's an agreement with the teachers union that we need to clean the schools. So Wednesdays is, is kind of off limits because we need to agree that something needs to shift. Either the schools need to be cleaned in the evening. I'm not sure exactly. The other thing that she said that was a barrier because my question was, why can't we have full days? I really couldn't understand if the kids are already there for three and a half hours, what was the barrier to them um, going a full day. 
Um, I thought maybe it was going to be something about lunch, and that was not the case. She said that it has to do with busing, that there was not enough time to clean the buses, um, which didn't make sense because I thought, well, they would have more time to clean the buses before the AM and PM, but I guess what we're doing in Wareham is we're cleaning before the high school route and then the elementary route, and this process takes around 40 minutes from what she explained to me. Now, again, I don't understand why there needs to be so much cleaning. I asked, um, because this is clearly not a teacher union issue because teachers aren't on the bus. So that's not um, what's blocking this. Um, but she felt that there was a need to clean um, at this extent, a 45 minute cleaning process. Um, and I'm not really clear why. I asked what she thought other towns were doing who seemed, other towns seemed capable of busing their students, and she felt her impression was that they weren't doing the cleaning that we were doing. So I don't really understand why we need to clean her responses that we have much lower rates. But what does lower rates translate to? Well, it doesn't translate to much. If we're not seeing severe illness, if we're not seeing morbidity and mortality, having more or less colds than other towns is not really, um, should not be a barrier to us getting our students back. I asked um, if the students were still being bused on every other seat, which she said, of course they were. And I wanted to know whether if the high school kids could be on one set of seats, could the elementary students be on the other set of seats? And she didn't have that answer. I don't know what the, if that's what was happening, Dr. Shaverhood, you weren't, you didn't get back to me. Uh, no, that was not what was happening. Not on one yeah. side and the other side, is that what you're asking? Yes, whether one set of seats, the open seats that were left by the high school students could be sat as the elementary students. Mm -hmm. So that there was never two students sharing the same seat that necessitated some sort of cleaning of the surfaces of the buses. So that's not what's happening. So I see, feel like there's some, some resolutions to some of these things that wouldn't require a 45 minute cleaning process simply by just allowing the elementary students to sit on the, the seats that the high school students aren't sitting on. She also mentioned that she needed to protect the bus driver. Well, this is interesting to me because the bus driver seems to have her own space. Um, she wouldn't necessarily be moving in and out of the seats except at, you know, to check to make sure there's no students. And I feel like that can be accomplished um, with her washing her hands or sanitizing her hands in between. So I'm not sure why the barriers and logistical barriers to going full days is bus cleaning and why we need a full day to um, clean the schools when other schools seem to be able to have their students back in um, at a much longer time. So Bridget, thank you for coming tonight. And yes, I was one of the school committee members who replied to you and said that it was definitely an ongoing conversation with the superintendent. It has continued to be an ongoing conversation. And um, I, I could tell you that if you stay tuned for the rest of the meeting tonight, there has been progress made and, and that will be discussed later in the meeting. I feel like that's a, a lot of what's happening is that there's progress, um, but really nothing is moving forward. Is no, there I actually- believe, I believe it is now. I believe okay. it is. I believe it is. Um, uh, the, the superintendent had, had already made progress. And then today there were some changes in some of the restrictions um, from DESE and, and that will allow, allow other things to happen also. I did speak with representative Gifford's office and she said that the school is also in, going to be in receipt of $150,000 grant. Is this correct? Yes. Um, is that going to help get our students back into school for more hours? Because right now I feel like we should be planning for the next stage of getting kids back into school closer to full time. And we're not even on par with what other towns are doing. So we're still behind the eight ball and we need to get closer to what other towns are doing. But we also need to be planning for the end of the year, looking towards more of a full time plan. Is that plan in process? Um, I would say yes. I mean, I would, I would direct that question to the superintendent. That's something that we're working on, yes. So, like I said, um, be patient and, and... I know, but we're, in, we're going into term three. So, like, I think that what I'm trying to say is, like, I think my patience is 
kind of wearing thin, if you can imagine. Um, no, I, say, I, I can imagine. I totally understand. And uh, when I say be patient, I mean, just wait till further in the meeting. And I think that some of your questions will be answered. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay. Joyce, I don't know if you can see my hand up. I don't know oh, if you I see. I'm sorry, I can't. A lot <laughs> of I don't know if I'm on your page. You never know that, but uh, okay. but I do just want to um, I mentioned Miss Kearns. I, as as you were talking, I, I looked at my emails and I, and I apologize because it was it was unread. I, I didn't even see it, so I do apologize. I do like to respond to people whenever they they write me, but um, I, I you know I, I've shared your concerns. I've heard from other parents with the same exact concerns, um, teachers actually with the same concerns. Um, so 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 I'll reach out to you after this meeting. I, I do hope you stay on for the meeting, and I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And uh, hopefully you'll have a better a better sense. And I'd like to hear what you have to say tomorrow. Thank you for your passion. Um, okay, I see that Mrs. Semple, Deanna, I'm assuming that's you, would like to speak. I don't see you on my screen. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, to clarify, because I, I do have a lot of the information. There's a lot of surrounding schools that are not only not, not up to the hours that Wareham is and has been since October, but they are full remote and continue to be remote and with no plans of, um, you know, to go in any further. So I can appreciate the um, frustration of parents, but every district and every school has to deal with different, um, you know, logistics, spacing in classrooms, lunches and so forth. So. I just want to make sure, um, you know, that it's understood that the teachers union is is willing to work with the district. But the safety of students and, and staff is at the top of of our list, and we will not waver on that. Um, so, you know, other schools have have less students than us. Perhaps they might have more busing. Um, you know, and I'm aware now today that Desi just changed some guidelines uh, as they do. Um, but I just want to make sure that it's clear that the teachers union is not a block, you know, of this. We are totally willing to work, but within the guidelines of safety, and that needs to be understood. Uh, this is very hard if anyone would like a list of what a teacher does during the day. It is a mountain of work. A teacher's day is, has always been full of work and they take it home and um, it's constant, but it's triple now. It's triple now. And um, I just need, I just need that to be understood. And um, you know, for folks to know that we are, we're being cooperative, but we're not going to sacrifice safety. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak during public participation? Okay. Seeing no one, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is good news. Um, if it's okay, I just wanna, I, I'm gonna start with, with good news. A couple of, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks ago, but um, a couple of meetings ago, uh, we heard from a couple of students from the high school who were concerned with um, the schedule there and, and classes. And um, so the good news is that they were able to make a, a change over there at the high school um, to the schedule. And um, from what I'm told um, and from what I hear, that that has been a good change. And I look forward to Emily. I know Emily's report is next and I look forward to Emily telling us more about that. Um, but for now, is there any other good news from anyone on the school committee? I guess I'll just go around because I am not sure I'm seeing everyone. Um, Mike? Uh, all set, thank you. Okay, Mary? Just that next week is vacation. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, April? No, I don't have anything. Okay. And Kevin. 
No news is good news. <laughs> okay, all right. So I just wanted to I just wanted to, to point that out and to thank those students who came forward um, with their concerns at our meeting. So Emily, go ahead with your report and feel free to add, you know, add to that good news about Wednesdays. Um, can you guys all hear me? Yes. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I'll speak to the Wednesdays first. Um, we've only um, had two of the Wednesdays so far, and I've already noticed that um, it's a lot less rushed um, since we only, like, we don't have all eight of those classes piled into one day. We're mm -hmm. actually able to, like, sit down and have, like, a regular lesson with these classes. I'm sure the teachers appreciate it, too, instead of having to open up, you know, eight different Zooms and like go from like class class so that's really good and the teachers are like really uh adamant about telling us like if you need any help during that like help block like after advisory like the zoom is open like please any questions mm -hmm. so that's really good and it's also i noticed a good impact um for our advisory um like we had that every wednesday before but it was kind of just like like close together with like together with everything else as well. But now we go to classes and then we have our lunch and then we go to advisory. And that's especially good for the seniors because there's a lot of communication um, that needs to be done during that. And all of us have um, longer to do that. So yeah, I've already noticed um, a positive influence um, from the Wednesdays. So that's really good. Um, Let's see what else. So Valentine's Day um, is coming up. So that's another thing that uh, heightens the spirits usually. Um, we usually have like a breakfast run by uh, Key Club um, pre-pandemic, but instead we improvised. And what we did was we sent out like a Google form um, and uh, students had the ability to fill it out and send uh, cute little messages or letters uh, in the mail to their friends. So that's something we had to do in place of that. And usually every year we like to uh, appreciate like a section of the staff. So this year um, we did that during Valentine's Day and we did that for the custodians who have been hard at work, you know, making sure everyone's safe and keeping things sanitized and whatnot. So we left um, gift bags in their break room and it had nice stuff in it. Like there was candy, there was a card with like a little Duncan gift card. And there was like a little lamp, which is like, it sounds so random, but it's useful. Um, we also left one uh, for the nurses and the librarian. So they all hopefully appreciated that. Um, that was myself and the Key Club uh, president. We handed those out. Um, so that's good news there. And other news is that um, the high school was able to fit in fall sports, obviously not during the fall. But mm -hmm. we fit it in anyway. Um, it's going to be fall sports coming up um, and then back to back uh, with spring. So it's going to go like right into each other. So that's going to be crazy to watch. Hopefully that'll bring back some of Viking spirit. Um, let's see. And tomorrow uh, is the last day of school before February break. So I'm sure kids are ready for that. So that's also good news. And I'm sure the teachers are ready for that too. So we could just have more time to prepare for the next last months of the school year. That happened fast. All right, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, and I just wanna say congratulations to you on being the most recent Scotty Montero award winner at the high school. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I feel like every time I open the newspaper, I'm reading something great about you. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting um, from January 7th, 2021. Does anyone have any questions or changes to be made to those minutes? Um, if not, then I'll ask for a motion to approve. So moved, Mike. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Kevin? Yes. Mike? Yes. Mary? Yes. And April? Yes. And myself? Yes. Five zero zero. We'll move on to the minutes from the meeting on January 21st. Are there any questions or changes to those minutes? 
If not, I'll ask for a motion to approve. So moved. And the second? second. Okay. I'll do a roll call vote, Gary. Yes. Mike? Yes. Kevin? Yes. April? Yes. And myself, yes. Five zero zero. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is an overview of a school day um, at John W. Dekas School with Mrs. Chandler. So this is a continuation we had asked um, that the principals come and just give us a, a look at what a day during this time, during the time of remote and hybrid and where school day looks a little bit different than we're used to. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bakiaki. Um, I chose to um, choose a day in the life of a, a hybrid student. We have a lot of children with different individual plans and at Deca School, we try to meet all of our children's needs. So each of our experiences are a little different at Deacus, but I chose to do a typical hybrid student. So if I may, our Deacus students arrive at school beginning at 8.50 a.m. When students arrive, they greet their teacher with their choice of a COVID-friendly greeting. Example, an air hug. Students enter their classroom, get settled, and begin individual morning work. Morning work includes journaling, possibly, practice on their sight word recognition, practice on their letter sounds, or maybe a word math problem. Once students are all together, teachers diligently work with students on core literacy standards, including fluency and composition. During the school day at Dicus, we have students have the opportunity to partake in 20 minutes PE or unified arts class. Students then learn new mathematical concepts, including methods of computation and geometry. When weather permits, students play outside and have outdoor classroom lessons. This year, many students have the opportunity to complete therapeutic obstacle courses, engaged in nature walks, and utilized our outdoor courtyard. Even now, we still have students out there sledding. Our dismissal for students right now currently begins at 12.30 p.m. Uh, during school dismissal, students continue to engage in academic activities and meet with their teachers for individual instruction until it is time for their individual dismissal. In the afternoons, students engage in remote activities that have been assigned on their virtual DECUS playlist by their teachers. And, um, I'm very, very proud of our students. I'm very proud of our Deacus families that are working so hard. Um, it's been really a, a unified effort on the teacher's behalf, the family's behalf, um, the support staff, paraprofessionals, um, our guidance counselors, uh, and everyone just to support um, our time to make sure that our students are, are trying to just navigate this year the best way we know how. And I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, yeah, Bethany, how many hours per week of synchronous instruction does the average hybrid student get? Well, if it's a remote student, remote students tend to have more because they're full without full, you know, full days of remote instruction. And typically young children do not have the capacity to be on Zoom as long of a time. So what our teachers, our remote teachers do um, in the early grades is log in, log out, log back in about four or five times a day. And they also include their paraprofessionals. There are paraprofessionals that are linked to the classrooms. Um, that help engage with that work as well. So they're all day, the lesson is played um, planned throughout the day, and the students are in and out of Zoom sessions. But again, uh, a five-year-old can't sustain a 60-minute Zoom class or even a 40-minute. So often, typically times, our Zooms last anywhere from, you know, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, and then the students work, and then they get re-engaged again. No, I, I get that. I guess I'm just trying to make sure that the students are receiving 35 hours of face-to-face -face synchronous instruction every 10 days. So that's why I was just wondering, like a hybrid student, what does he get or she get per per week? Yes, we've met that, and I we sent that all into the district. Andrea Schwamm brought that over to um, the district, and I do believe we got that report back from the state, indicating that we're doing that. 
So we're getting at least 17 and a half hours a week. Yeah. Yes, typically, typically just to, to, just to help out. It's three point, it's four hours of in-person for the hybrid, right, for kids on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. There's an hour of synchronous following that, that when they get home. And then uh, a little bit of time of asynchronous, not so much as with the littler kids because they need more support from people. So they're at about um, 5.5 hours a day um, overall. So it, so it works in how they do it. Um, but that's the actual time frames. You know, you do like the morning time and then you do the afternoon time and it changes depending on how the schedule is. And the report's kind of complicated to fill out, but they want like a typical week. So I follow the Monday, Tuesday, and then it's remote basically for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but it isn't, but it is. Do you see what I mean? So it's just hard to figure it out, but it's about five, 5.5 hours a week, uh, a day, which then equals the, 35 hours in 10 days. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Bethany? Bethany, a question that I had was um, teachers. So if I'm a first grade teacher, do I have, am I hybrid or remote or is it a mixture? So are there any teachers who are only teaching in remote classroom? Um, I have, we have two kindergarten remote classes. We have three first grade remote classes due to the number originally we got from the summertime. And we have two grade two remote classes, full remote. Okay. And so if I'm a teacher who has a hybrid class and then that a student decides to go remote for whatever reason, there are many reasons mm -hmm. why that could happen. Um, does that student remain in my class and just switches to all remote? How does typically, depending it's a it's an individual scenario basis, but typically I would put them back and I'd put them into a full remote classroom so they can meet the minutes. Okay. And is there a difference between class sizes between those two models? Um, yes, although that has changed. I do have to say, um, I uh, at the beginning, my remote classes were very high. I had about 22 to 24 students in remote classes. And now that has dropped down to 19, 20. I am seeing an influx of um, families who are now going to hybrid in their midpoints, whether it's a teacher recommendation or a parent recommendation. Um, I'm making some changes there due to just the need of the child. We have to look at what sometimes what looks good for a child in the fall because we're looking at safety and COVID and all of that. And then we realize by January, like, oh, he just, this child just would be better at school. So mm -hmm. those changes are being made. Well, that's, that's good. Cause I know at some levels, they're not able to make those changes mid-year mid or midterm. So at your level, you are able to make those changes. We have to do what's best for the child. So it's just a conversation between the teachers and the staff and then the families to determine what's the best for the child. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mike, did you have a question or no? Uh, no, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say, I, I really like this part of the agenda. And I, I, always, look at, I always look forward to hearing from the teachers, the principals and and I, I miss visiting Dekas. I always I have a soft spot for that school. So <laughs> miss you guys. April? Uh, jo Joyce, I think. Oh, April, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, I, hi, Bethany. How are you? Um, Good. Yeah, so a question is, um, have you had um, a, a small percentage or a significant percentage of children who have had um, trouble logging on during the school time due to, you know, the inability to have parents available or childcare available during those remote times during the, either the hybrid or the full remote um, with them logging on or needing to be logged on later in the day and how are the teachers handling that? Um, so 
I believe um, this is a connect, it's either a connectivity issue possibly. Lots of times what happens is that families will call right to the school. We either hook them up right with the teacher or we will um, connect them to Dave, our new tech, um, he's our tech personnel who does an amazing job um, of supporting the families who are having connectivity issues or logging on difficulties. Um, sometimes it's us having a hard time with our connectivity issues. These things happen, so we just have to adjust to our practice as necessary. Um, I would also say that the um, daycares and, and preschools have been wonderful working collaboratively with the teachers. Um, we're doing like we can. It's a, it's a community effort of having um, families engage in remote activities. I, you know, I do have to say, I think it is, it's, it can be difficult for um, some parents more than others. I think that we have a, a remote population that is very um, dedicated to the remote setting. And I feel like there are a few sets of families that are not as dedicated and we're working together with those families to um, make it the best, give the best opportunity for children we can. And I just have to say also, in addition, our staff creates packets every week or every two weeks. We are always supplying children with the materials needed for at home. So if you've ever driven by Dicas, if you just look outside, you can see our teacher bins. We have bins and bins of school materials for our students. So each week or every other week, um, our staff is preparing materials for the following week to make sure that these students are ready and know what they are working on. If there's any hard, um, you know, paper materials or whatever it is, they have the materials necessary to perform the lessons and tasks at hand for the following week. Are there any issues with um, like remote specific classrooms getting to be too much for those specific teachers? So say like if families have decided to move away from either hybrid um, and move their child into the fully remote. I know you have a, a designated amount of remote only teachers. What happens, like what's the average class size for that? And what happens if more people may choose to go remote from that? I don't, I, if I can speak honestly, I don't think that that's going to happen. The trend that I'm seeing is going down in the remote settings, it's going down. It's not going up. Um, I'm seeing a trend where more students are coming in as hybrid at this point in, in the stage of the game. So I don't feel like that's going to be a concern. Um, the remote teachers have support of paraprofessionals. There's, um, we have, it, the, and so they are working and they work really well together as well. Um, remember, there's also special education teachers, the Unified Arts, they're all coming in and working yeah. throughout the day in those classrooms as well. So we just work to support each other. Thank you. Right, I think Mary has a question too. Yes. Yep. Mary. Yes, I, yes, I do. So um, actually, it's two questions. Uh, first one is about the sub-separate um, students. Are do you have any that are remote? I, they are, Mary. I do have remote sub-separate students. So then um, an extra or extended uh, question to that is, then, is it the same teacher that's doing the remote or do you have someone else? Same teacher and those teachers are streaming in their classrooms during that time, during throughout the day. How's that working? Well, it's working yeah. very well. Okay. I mean, I think sometimes the camera kind of moves or, you know, because we're doing document cameras and we've got video cameras, but um, it, it seems to be working okay. I mean, I think it's difficult when you have um, students with significant needs that are in front of you and you have students with significant needs that are on a camera. You're just trying to teach right. both. Yeah. So it's working with the paraprofessionals. It's working with support staff um, to uh, make it work the best that we can. And they're doing a tremendous job. Oh, I'm sure they it's are. It's really remarkable. It's very, it's difficult. It is. Um, then my other, my other question is about preschool. Um, I don't remember how, what ended up happening. Did, did um, the regular 
ed preschool students end up attending or are they not attending? The typical peers, I should say. Uh, yes, Mary, we did end up having peers come in and, and then I'm very happy about that. And what we decided to do was the second year peers. So we welcomed back all of the um, second year peers, uh, the peers that were um, in the system. Um, so all of the four-year-olds are attending. Uh, do you peers. have any remote preschool? Yes, we have, we do have remote yeah. preschool students. We certainly do. Yes, we do. And would they, and are any of them the typical peers or is just the special ed? It's, um, I think it's generally the special ed. Yeah. I think we do have a few, I, I don't know if it's like five or six, I'd have to look at my notes um, for preschool, but we do have, I think we have a, a few handful that are remote and peers. And how does that work? Because um, the preschool, many of the classrooms are half day classrooms. Right. So we've worked it out where, um, it depends on which teacher it is, but there are um, students who, there are preschool students who come four days a week. There are preschool students who come two days a week. There are preschool students who are remote. And those students who are remote are going the opposite. They're zooming in the opposite days if they're peers than they are with the other. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated schedule, but it, it works out for um, teachers load. So um, one preschool teacher may be working with students for two days and then the other teacher, then the same teacher is remote for two days with the other group of preschoolers. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Bethany. Thanks for, for being here. Thank really you all. And I wanna say thank you for everyone I know. Um, how hard everybody's working and so it's greatly appreciated and we will continue our due diligence at DECAS. Thank you. Okay, and then Joan is here to tell us about a day at Minot. All right, so students are, who are dropped off by car enter the building first at 840. They sanitize their hands as they enter and they walk to their classrooms. Bus students enter the building at 850 and they sanitize their hands. Students go to their classroom first, then they proceed a few at a time to their lockers to hang up their coats and their backpacks. All of this is done by supervision and social distancing. One student who was walking down the hall this week said to Mr. Hart, my music teacher, who is the Judy Hall teacher, I know Mr. Hart, smile and don't forget to sanitize your hands at the bottom of the stairway. He offered her a job when he retires. Our teachers who have full-time remote students start Zooming right away. Some are doing 8.30 Zooms. I've seen some of my special ed teachers on right at 8.30. So anywhere between 8.30 and 9, the remote teachers are jumping on board with their classes. Um, they Zoom until 10.30. They may be teaching an ELA class. It may be a teacher that's teaching the math class. They have morning meeting with their students. Um, and one of the teachers uses my pre-recorded pledges that I have on my landing page with the class. So if you go to the landing page and you click on the flag, you have my voice saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Or if you click on the minor pledge, you have my voice saying the, the minor pledge. So she uses that um, when she does the morning meetings with the kids. Um, teachers are teaching whole group lessons um, in the morning. They also are breaking up their groups into small groups via the breakout rooms. Independent work also is assigned to the students. Um, then they have their next block of content. So like at 10.30 or so, um, they may switch to their other content area. Uh, the, they have a lunch break around 11.30 to 12. And then for the remote teachers, they're starting back up at 12 o'clock with additional Zooms. They incorporate writing throughout the day they're using their afternoon Zoom time for small group work. Um, they are available to help students. So they leave their Zooms open as well. Students can come in if they need any help with any of their work. Um, they work independently on Lexia, ST Math, any makeup assignments they might have. Um, they have Unified Arts in the afternoon and all of that equates to about 21 hours a week. There's your answer for that question, Kevin. Mm -hmm. But our hybrid cohorts, uh, the day starts with the morning meeting routines. So very similar, whether you're remote or you're hybrid. 
Um, I visited one class this week as they were saying the Pledge of Allegiance and they were reciting the minor pledge. Um, they have their ELA, their math class, just like the remote classes do. The teacher here is walking around the classroom, helping anybody in need. The students still have independent time to do their Lexia, some ST math, vocabulary games. Um, they do their reach for reading online. Everything is, is basically online. Um, the teachers are using their whiteboards, their interactive whiteboards, you know, throughout the day. This year, we still have some teams of teachers. So we have two teachers working together. One's teaching ELA and math, and one is teaching math. Um, one teaches social studies, one teaches science. Uh, instead of the students moving the classrooms like we've done traditionally in the past, the students remain where they are and the teachers switch classrooms. That's to keep the um, cross-contamination of students sitting at other desks. Um, so I have observed very religiously the teachers coming in, they'll wipe down their specified area before they leave their classroom. They also wipe it down when they enter the new classroom. And this routine is repeated when they return to their homeroom class. Um, I do have some teachers that are also are self-contained, meaning they are teaching all subjects. So they keep the same group of students all day. So they're not moving around. Um, and that was just pure choice based on, you know, everything that was happening this year. Uh, we do take students outside, weather permitting for their scheduled mass break. We have breaks at 10, 10, 15, and 10, 30, depending on the schedule. Again, they sanitize their hands before they go out. They sanitize their hands when they enter the building. Teachers review, um, but before they leave for dismissal, they will review with them what they need to do for the afternoon. So if they have Monday, Tuesday cohort, they're reminding them what you have to do when you go home today um, and so forth. Um, they have additional Zooms that they do in the afternoon with them. As I said before, Unified Arts also uh, uh, have classes for these students as well. Our parent pickup begins at 1220. Our bus dismissal begins at 1228. These separate times are to keep the students separated in the halls to maintain social distancing. Students are sent home with lunch and breakfast. Um, once the students are gone, the teachers take their lunch break and then they're ready to start Zooming with the other, the opposite cohort. So if it's a Monday, Tuesday, they have to Zoom with their Thursday, Friday cohort in the afternoons. So they're doing some teaching of lessons um, with them. We know that not all students are logging on when the teacher is there. So the teachers have become great about um, making videos of the lessons. They post that in Google Classroom. So if a student can't join the particular Zoom at that time, they're able to catch up with it later on. Um, and we're really trying to make sure the students fill out the attendance form so they can get credit for being there that particular day. And all of that equates to about 21 hours a week. Um, in addition, we have paraprofessionals who are helping students in person for the, the hybrid classes. Um, they're also doing small group work via Zoom or Google Meet. Our special education teachers work in the classrooms for the inclusion classes with students. They're also working with students remotely um, by Zoom as well. So as I dropped into some Zooms this week for my walkthroughs, or maybe I should call them Zoom throughs, I was amazed at the patience the teachers have with remote learning. Whether it's a fully remote class or the teachers working with the opposite cohort in the afternoon, I saw many students who had glitches with technology at times. Um, they know how to check their teachers' landing pages to, to access what they need. They go in, into Google Classroom to check their assignments. They know how to mute themselves, unmute themselves, turn the cameras on and off, and they can share their screen so they can demonstrate the work that they're doing. They also help each other out. So if one student was having an issue, a classmate was able to, to join in and, and problem solve for them. Teachers are monitoring the background of what is behind the camera, which is kind of pretty tricky at times. And they are trying not to get dizzy as the students are twirling, moving, sitting, laying down, etc. So unlike the Zoom screen that we have right now, where everyone is pretty still, there is always movement on a student Zoom screen. So that, that's basically life 
um, via remote or hybrid with our students. Thank you. Um, April? Are you having um, in your um, grade levels, how is your um, Zoom attendance for those kids that are remote or on the remote days? Are you having to reach out to families fairly often or is it um, pretty full uh, attendance most of the time for the kids that are at home? So for, for the most part, the Zooms are going well and the students are logging on. We do have a small percentage of students, um, whether they're fully remote or it's on their remote days that are having difficulty logging in. So our team of staff um, are working diligently with the kids, with the families, trying to figure out what the issues are. Um, we have attendance meetings with families as well if the students are not joining in. So yes, there are a handful of, of students in, in both kind of um, scenarios that we're trying to work with. But for the most part, the kids are logging in with their Zooms. So for those ones that are having, um, you know, the, either the connectivity issues or the absence issues, is there a, uh, a, a common reason as to why, or does it vary significantly case to case? It does vary significantly. Um, it really isn't much of a connectivity issue because we've given out so many hotspots this year. So we wanted to make sure they had that ability. Um, some students are at daycare. However, if they're not logging on at that particular time, they may be logging on later on in the day. So the teachers have been great about checking the attendance later in the afternoon to make sure the kids were there. Um, they do a lot of reaching out to families as well, whether it's by phone, they have Google voice numbers, um, they use Class Dojo, they're emailing, you know, all the time to try to connect with families. And then the social worker, the counselors, the dean, you know, we're all reaching out as well because we want to keep kids connected. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, again, I love this part of the, the meeting. And um, Ms. Simmons, you mentioned um, Mr. Hart, and it, rem it reminded me of, um, for some reason, out of all the you know Facebook feeds I'm on for the schools, I get the most messages from, from the Minot feed. <laughs> and one of the best ones was um, Mr. Hart playing his little ukulele as the kids were coming in. That, that was the best ever. It, it like, melted my heart to see see something at least a little bit normal, you know, and the, welcoming the kids coming and stuff. And that, that was great. Yeah, he does a great job with them. Yeah. So Joan, I guess I'll ask you the same question I asked Bethany. Um, so are there teachers in Minot who are all remote or all hybrid or is everything combined? So there are. Yes, yeah, so we have teachers who are strictly hybrid teachers. We have teachers, it's actually three in each grade level, three teachers in third grade and three and fourth who are strictly fully remote. Um, we have had children swapping um, their learning plan. It's gone both ways. We've had some hybrid go remote. We've had some remote go hybrid. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the fall when we suddenly saw that influx of cases in Wareham, we had a lot of families who panicked and got very worried and they wanted to switch their children to remote. Um, my remote classes are definitely <laughs> higher than the hybrid classes. Uh, we're seeing a few more coming back to the hybrid right now. Um, but in third grade, my remote classes are, are higher. Mm -hmm. um, one of my teachers was very kind enough when one of her hybrid students was going to go remote and we talk about this as a staff, what are we going to do? Because I feel bad for the other classes that are, whose um, numbers are getting higher. She offered to keep her student and do remote with him like in the afternoon and on the opposite cohort days. And mm -hmm. she said, it's going to be better because he won't have to switch teachers because we do have them switch if they change their plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that really worked out well. And I think that would be the trend we would try to go with if, if we have any more that are op opting to go remote. Mm -hmm. to we keep... still have families who, there's misinformation out there, 
but they are still pretty worried. Um, and we do try to reassure them about all the cleaning we are doing during the day, the constant um, hand sanitizing that we're doing with the students. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Kevin or Mary, did you have it? Oh, Kim, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'll wrap up. Um, I'm good. Thank you very much, John. Yep. So it's the same question about the sub-separate. So do you have remote sub-separate? Yes, we do. Um, they're a little bit different because it's a smaller class size in some cases. So we have the students who are remote will zoom into the classroom. So they do a lot of morning meeting. They do various exercises. So that, you know, one or two remote students are um, still part of the class. So it is the same teacher that's doing both. Okay, thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Kim. I just want to thank both Bethany and Joan and their staffs for all of their hard work this year. You know, I wish people could see the change in how we offer school this year and the flexibility and the hard work and the collaboration that has had to take place. It's just been remarkable and, it, and I think it speaks to their leadership and I'm very grateful that they are the building leaders and they have the staff they do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank for you. Time. You guys are busy enough already, and I appreciate that you took the time to come here tonight to share that. So we've heard now, last time we heard from um, Tracy Cote from the middle school, and at our next meeting, we will hear from Scott Palladino from the high school on the same subject. Thank you. All right, so we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the school, the proposed school calendar for next year. Yes. So really the process of when we begin to draft the school calendar, it begins in the assistant superintendent's office and in the superintendent's office. And we begin by reviewing the calendar to determine if there are any adjustments that need to be made for the following year. We have to look at staff orientation, the first day of school, making sure that we have the holidays, the vacation days, professional days, and the last day of school and to make sure that we've included the right number of days in the calendar. After we've done all of that, we then hand over the draft to the WEA leadership team for their review. And once they accept the draft, it's brought back to the superintendent's office and then we're able to put the draft on the vote for the school committee to accept. And so that's where we're at today. We've uh, taken this draft through the process it needs to go through. And now I would ask that you vote to accept the school calendar for 2021-22. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? April, go ahead. I don't have a question, just more of a comment. Um, I am noticing, looking at it, that the terminology for Columbus Day has been changed to holiday observed. And I know that um, in previous meetings, uh, there was um, an agenda item to discuss the possibility of removing um, the Columbus Day connotation from the calendar. So it is um, nice to see that it has been um, changed to say just a holiday observed as opposed to um, either Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day. Okay, what, can, um, was that deliberate for that reason? I think we are trying to be politically correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We did have an agenda item, um, April, but the person who requested that agenda item and just didn't didn't follow up, so that's why we never, we never did actually discuss it at a meeting. Um, anyone else? Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that um, I, had, I had posted this on, um, on social media for feedback, um, and, I, and I was surprised. I had a parent um, ask me that, that they didn't see it. They, they, they couldn't find it on, on the school committee packet on the website, and I was surprised at that. But 
but I, I wish we did have it up there. But anyway, um, I, I didn't have any feedback from the um, from from anything on social media, so no news is good news. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schwab, yeah, I just want to say that it can be really confusing for people to put a draft calendar out there without the understanding that it hasn't been accepted in the vote because right. then people forget, they don't realize that it's a draft and they see it and they put all the dates in and then things might change or things may shift as a result of the different parties that have to take a look. And so to avoid the confusion of people thinking that that's what it is, we wait at least until we have word from the school committee that they that, that you all accept it and then there's no problem, we share it with everybody. Like it's here you go, let's go because it's actually been approved. So, I mean, I think you just need to be careful uh, with those kind of things because people can get really jammed up when they when they plan around such an event, you know, that calendar and it and it shifts for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah I did say that we were going to vote on it, but it wasn't wasn't final. But yeah, anyway, yeah. I think that's I think that's we're, it's just trying to be careful, and we never, you know, we just want to do the the right thing in the in that. And so, I understand your point, but I just think. From the other side, we, we also just wanted to share that it wasn't an, an intentional. Yeah, it, yeah. it was actually because it was thought. It was trying to be thoughtful. It's it's more it's more of a it's more of an issue I think with the packet itself. I mean, the, the public should basically see everything that we see as far as the packet goes, so they could probably comment if they'd like to at public participation. And if if I didn't put that out there, no one would have a clue, and we would have voted on it. And 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 then maybe tomorrow people would be livid, being like, oh, "What about this? And what about that?" But this time around, thank God, no, nobody's saying anything. Okay, so are, is this is this calendar built around the same timing as as previous calendars, as far as the first day of school? And yes, okay. The okay. only issue that comes up is MCAS and the professional days. Because if, because um, they haven't posted the, the dates for MCAS mm -hmm. for the following year. And if a half a day, professional day is on a, on a profession, if, a, if the MCAS is scheduled and they have to give it during a specific time, we may have to shift a professional day. Okay. See what I mean? We've had to do that every year because, they, because they're slow to give us the dates. Right, well, those MCAS dates are generally not released when we approve the calendar ever, right? Correct. Um, and did you switch the early release days? Were those before maybe on Tuesdays and now did you switch them to Wednesdays this year and then decide to keep it that way? Yes. Is that what happened? Okay. Okay. So if there are no other questions, we'll ask for a motion to approve the calendar. So moved. Second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote, Kevin. Yes. Mike? Yes. Mike? Yes. Did you hear me? I heard you, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Mary? Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear my name. Okay, yes. Um, April? Yes. And myself, yes. So it passes five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is the um, W, the Wareham Public School 2026 Strategic Plan with Dr. Schwamm. Yes, yeah, so um, during this pandemic, when everybody's been busy just kind of trying to keep their head above water, I have also spent a lot of time thinking about our future um, and where the district needs to go. And it's also just a good time for that because our current strategic plan, WPS 2021, is coming to a close at the end of this year. So um, I've done a lot of research, uh, probably for about eight months. Um, I have a reading list of all the things that I've read in the articles and I summarized all that information, 22 pages of notes and started to think about all the things that are happening and where we are and um, what, what might we need to do and uh, realized that um, you know, we just need to be really thoughtful about where we're heading and we need to have a, a clear vision and stick to that vision, just like we have done for WPS 2021. The um, growth and the, the things that have happened as a result since the beginning of that have been incredible, amazing. And I'm, I'm just so um, proud of the work that everyone in the district has done to get us where we are 
Um, it, it's been not short of amazing. So that being said, that plan was pretty, um, it, was, it was also formed with a committee of, of stakeholders and we, we've, we created that plan and then the committee voted and we've been on that plan ever since. So basically that plan was pretty innovative. And we know that because we're looking at what we need to do for the future and much of what's already on the WPS 2021 needs to come over to the 2026 and, and stay there like student voice, um, rigor, engagement, you know, things like that, right? We, we need to keep up with all of that. And we also need to look at um, creating modern curriculum uh, we have probably, I don't know, 150 units at least of really good um, curriculum that's been created. But we want to look at that and see, is it, can it be blended? Is it available? It, do we have enough um, student choice in assessment? Are there performance-based assessments? So anyway, we need to look more deeply at what we've already created and, and do more with that. We also need to be digitally convergent. And what that means really quite simply is that you take the ideas of all of the people around you, and you have everything available and anything that you need is transparent and seamless through the digital application. So you have to look at your network and you have to look at where you are and what you have and what, what you want available with curriculum, instruction, professional development, assessment, all of those things. And then and the digital convergence is the ability to have easy access to any one of those things at any time. So in five years from now, we, we hope to be that seamless. So it's not such an odd, right? So it's not so fragmented. And right now it's fragmented. We have a lot going on, but it's, but it's not as seamless and clean as it needs to be um, to have that access. So nonetheless, um, I've worked with Modern Teacher who has a digital convergence framework that looks at the drivers of change and standards. There are a hundred and something standards connected to each of the seven or six drivers of change. I looked at that, looked at the IB learner profile, which, are, which is tied very nicely into 21st century skills that our children need to, to attain, to attain to be successful. Not too much. Um, Watching the school committee meeting. Oh, yeah. Oh, anyway, somebody's not muted. Um, <laughs> So anyway, we looked at a whole bunch of different elements as well as our previous plan and first created a steering committee of mostly people within the school. And we had our first meeting on January 27th. From there, Dr. Shaverhood sent out a message from the top inviting all stakeholders from the whole community inside and outside of the school to join on the strategic planning um, committee. Our next meeting is February 24th. And um, they're all via Zoom, obviously. And so we've pretty much picked out this, the five areas that we're going to focus on are the big ideas, which are student learning or scholarship and student learning, uh, professional learning, social emotional learning, um, community, college, career and life inspired and um, digital convergence, looking at our digital ecosystems and making sure that what we have is, is adequate and that can serve our, our students and everyone teaching them within and the families that need to access. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we have a plan or somewhat of a, an outline of a plan, which the, and all of the people on the committee, which is about 38. Now I have 38 people who have, uh, are coming in to join, join us with this work, um, have all been put into groups and where they're going to start to create goals and with each goal, there has to be an assessment connected to the goal. So that, that also needs to be more uh, clearly articulated when reported out at the end, right? So, so we want it to be a working document and a live document, not so much in the vision. You know, the vision will be pretty clear. We're looking at branding and we've, I've invited the art teachers to do a lesson that the students will then be able to create the visual representation of the brand once the branding has been chosen. Um, and then they will vote on that and their, their brand will be our brand of our, of our plan. And that's pretty exciting. So it will be student driven. The, school, uh, the student council at the high school uh, will be looking at the plan. I have with, with uh, Mr. Palladino set up two meetings already in May 
first meeting in May, at the beginning of May, they will look at the plan. I'll help, you know, they'll, will have hopefully got it pretty, you know, much together, at least in a decent draft form for them to take a look at and then ask me any questions. And then I will meet them again at the end with all of the suggestions that they may have as well. So they're going to participate in the plan um, as part of just as many, as much as we can have as many stakeholders involved. So I'm very obviously excited about it as you can might tell just from the presentation, but um, it's definitely giving us a, a lot of hope um, and quite a lot to think about in some really exciting ways uh, for the future of our children in Wareham. Um, so I will keep you posted. All right, great, thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Kevin, are you the committee member on the strategic plan committee? I am, I'm on the, uh, gonna be on the scholarship student learning subcommittee of the strategic plan. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more if no one has any questions. Um, I, I, I'd just like to thank, just like to thank, you know, Dr. Schwamm and those involved. And I know she really gets into this and um, takes it very seriously and, um, and she does a good job with it. Thank you. Um, no, you answered all the questions that I had, except for um, the committee, the 38 people, which is which is great to be able to assemble that many people. Where where are they all from? Like, are they teachers or community members? How what is the makeup of the committee? So uh, the makeup of the committee, the oh, the steering committee were mostly the leaders and department chairs and a guidance counselor, uh, guidance counselor department chair. You know things like that was the steering committee. But then um, I was kind of um, surprised by when by the people that responded, mm -hmm. um, in a good way. So I have a select men involved, select woman involved, um, another gentleman who I have not, who I've not, that I don't know who's from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Sweat is involved um, because I asked him <laughs> and he said yes, kindly enough. Um, um, there's, oh, another woman who was actually spoke publicly at one of our meetings last year, at the end of last year. So she's asked to be involved. And I had a, a subsequent conversation with her following that meeting, which was, I think, good. And she's already jumped in and she's involved. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, it'll be an interesting group. Um, and then teachers, I have the union president who's involved, which is very exciting um, to have that. Another classroom teacher from the middle school is involved. So I think it'll be a, it's, it's, it's a good group, of course. I would love to have more people in some ways, although each group has, the student learning has the largest number, uh, but each group has between five and seven people on their, you know, on each group. So we have some room to grow that a little bit more, but you don't, you just don't want it to get so big that you can't, you know, that you can't get the, the right amount of things done, but um, it should be really interesting. Well, I look forward to hearing more. So will we hear updates from you along the way? Will we, no, will we not hear again until you're completed? How, how will that go? Uh, well, the plan, the completion plan will be to, my hope is that the plan will be in a good, good enough space to ask for a school committee vote at the last meeting in June. Oh, good, okay. Because I would like to start the new year with the new plan, right? Because 21 will be over, so to speak. And we'd like to jump into the next, um, you know, I, I, I would just feel comfortable if we were on our new you know, plan by that time. Um, and it will be up to whoever sets the agenda for the school committee meeting, you know, on, on updates, but we'll be meeting at least monthly. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be meeting and breakout groups. So I'll start the meetings and we'll come back to the meetings. I have, oh, um, my secretary's taking notes too. So the first set of notes just went out to the steering committee um, for their approval, uh, looking to see, is there something we missed or, or whatever the case may be. And then those will be posted online mm -hmm. as well. So our progress for every meeting will be recorded and reported out and available to anyone who cares to read about that. But I'm also, whenever you'd like me to, um, if you'd like to set the agenda or whatever the case may be, even if it's on the fly, I'm happy to talk, obviously, too happy to talk about it. Well, maybe at a midpoint, so maybe sometime in April, we, sure. can, we can talk about it and, and put it on the agenda then. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the end of year report with Christine Suko. Um, yeah, in your packet, you received um, a two pager. Um, this is just gonna summarize the LEA um, funds. The town appropriation was 29,430,737. The total expenditures from LEA was 29,262,564. No encumbrances at the end of the year. And we were able to return back to the town 168,174. Mm -hmm. You go to the next page. I broke it out by the major accounts. If you notice that um, it's now has instructional that we voted at the last school committee meeting. So as you see the actual expenditures for um, FY20, 74.63% was spent on instruction or instructional. Mm -hmm. So then um, the general, the general fund, like, and like I said, was spent 29,262,564. The total of money of the grants that was spent was 2,533,501. Our total revolving funds spent was 2,886,796. So the total expenditure between grants, revolving funds, and the town appropriation was 34,682,861. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Mike? Mike. Just a quick one. Um, do, do we have the in-kind figures from the town? Pardon me? The in-kind from the town? I don't have that on this report, no. Okay. Do you, do you have a rough idea on what it is? Maybe about 17 million? I don't know. That's a that's a total yeah. guess. Because it's yeah. high It's high with insurance. So. Can you, can you get back to us on it? Sure thing. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. I expect it's somewhere around eight. It usually hovers around there. <laughs> I think and, it was yeah. a little more. I think it was a little more this year. Okay. But I can get that to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. April. Are the programs with other school districts? Is that the school choice um, fees? Mm. No, that's um, uh, special education and uh, an agriculture out, out of other schools outside of ours. So that would be any collaborative or private schools or um, where are they? Bristol Aggie. Okay, that's what that is. thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Christine. Thank you. We'll move on to the um, transfers, the budget transfers. Sure. You got, I think it's a single page and mm -hmm. I, it's just showing to and from where and the account numbers and what's being moved from one account to another. And there's no change to the bottom line in the LEA budget. I don't know if you want me to go through every line or. Um, no, I mean, I don't think you need to. It, it's, it's all here. Does anyone have any questions about these transfers, Mike? Yeah, just uh, what's going on with central heating and central utilities? Why are we transferring those amounts in? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah well, my pro our projections show that um, we're gonna need additional funds for there. So I projected out the utilities and that's why they're, I moved them around within the utilities of what the projections are for, so, till, till the end of the year. So central, is that the, um, the you know, the multi-service center? Part of it, right? What, what else would be central? I think we're paying east, right? East utilities are coming out of central, that building east. But that, that should be pretty trivial though, right? Um. Uh, We've seen a spike in at East with the utilities. Um, and we also pay the Boys and Girls Club. Do, so 
so we pay the we pay the Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. I think she means the building that we refer to as the Boys and Girls Club, right? Yeah, not the real Boys and Girls Club, the old Boys and Girls Club. Oh, so not not Hammond. No, not Hammond. Uh, where right. the club was. So the, the high so school the, weight room that they're using. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And, and we just, I mean, that's $25,000 to central utilities from high school utilities. So it's, it sounds like the high school doesn't need it, but central does. Yes. So, so like, like in, my, in my projection. Yeah. But, but we don't and, know really, we really don't know why. Well, I think that at the high school, you did some retrofitting long before I was here. And I think that we're starting to reap the benefits from that. So that's, so that'd be, that'd be great. And, and, and so, so to, to, to be a source of where to take the money from, but, but I'm just curious why, why, why the central utilities went up so much. Well, because we're, we're paying for East, we're paying for. Um, is that new? Kim, is that new? We've always been paying for East, right? We have been paying for East. Um, we've had some utility. Um, uh, issues there so we've been working on that and it's cost us a little bit more money than what we had budgeted also last year when we were trying to make the budget fit and not cut staff we probably were a little bit too happy in slot uh, slashing utilities at central to um, make it work okay and, and now it looks like we need to, to put a lot of money into middle school utilities, 35,000. Like yeah, what's I, can, going on? Uh, I can speak to that because what we, had, what we had done last year, we had helped with mine it, offset the heating at the middle school. And right now we're letting the middle school stand on their own and mine it is not absorbing any of the heating. So we still have that heating um, money at the middle, at mine it that's being moved into middle school because that's what they're really using. Okay. All right. Um, can, can you just get back to me on, on the central, like what's going on with the East? Like that's, I'd like to know sure. more about that. I'd like to know. Sure. Sure thing. All right, thank you. Thank cool. you. April. So you said that a portion of those central utilities are for the multi-service um, building. Yes. So I'm just curious on the last line with the middle school subs, um, with the monies being moved to central office building, where it says main contracted and main other, that's also the multi-service center, correct? Yes. So what's the difference between the, the two accounts? from the central utilities to those, what is it need for building main other and building main oh, contracted? Oh, that's for, build, that's for um, building maintenance contracted and building maintenance other uh, supplies or other that okay, isn't so a contracted service. When I saw main, I was like, I, I was confused as to what Oh no, that, it's, main, it's maintenance. I should have put a T on the end. I, yeah, I was gonna say either that or put a period so we know it's not the word main. So just may wanna. <laughs> Cause I looked at it like that was a main building and then I was like, oh, I oh, see. it's very, nope. thank you. No problem. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll ask for a motion to approve the budget transfers. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, a uh, motion and a second. We'll do a roll call vote. Kevin? Yes. Mike? Yes. Mary? Yes. April? Yes. And myself, yes. So five zero zero. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the report of the superintendent. Okay, um, I would like to ask the committee to please approve the bill and payroll warrants as listed in the newsletter. Moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Kevin? Yes. Mike? Yes. Mary? Yes. April? Yes. And myself, yes. So five zero zero. Thank you. All right, so moving on. Um, you know, this year, when we 
look at our budget, we're finding that we're having some money remaining in the LEA. We also have been receiving a number of grants, grants and additional um, money that we need to spend. So I would ask the committee for their, um, not approval because you didn't vote this, but just for the go ahead to restore the custodians to from what they took last year, they took a zero and gave up their raise and steps to make our budget work, as well as the administrators who also said that they would take a zero to make our budget work. So what we would like to do is to restore their pay to what it would have been had they not taken the zero. This money will come out of some grants that we've received. And also we have, we will be having some extra money in the LEA because of um, how we've operated this year. So at this point, we would be uh, moving ahead. We would make it retroactive. And I just want to express my appreciation to the custodians, to the administrators for their willingness to do so. They certainly helped us out in a time that we were extremely concerned about our budget moving into this year and their willingness to, um, to make that sacrifice is greatly appreciated. Mike. Uh, thanks, Kim. I, I appreciate that too, and I, I'm really happy to hear about this. Can we just so so we're, t we're discussing custodians, assistant principals, and directors, right? No, uh, we're discussing custodians and administrators. That would be directors and principals, and okay. assistant superintendent. Okay, and and could, for each of those, can we just mention what what dollar figure that would amount to? Yes. For the custodians, it would be $25,796. And for our administrators, it would be $28,818. All right. And, and, so, and so, yeah, I, I echo your comments as well. This is the, the, back when, when we were negotiating and, and trying to figure this all out, they really did step up, step up and take one for the team. And, and this is our way of really working in good faith and, and restoring that. And, and, and I mean, like I said, we don't. You don't need our vote, but 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 you'd have mine if 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 we if we needed to vote for it. My full throated support. Thank you. Thank you to them too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just say likewise. Um, everyone, we heard earlier that teachers are working hard this year. We know that, but we also know how hard administrators are and the importance of custodians during this pandemic. So I think it's uh, very fortunate that we're able to do this, and I appreciate. You can bring this to our attention and thanking these people that deserve our thanks. Yes, I, I mean, I agree, of course. Um, you know, like Mike said, you don't need our vote, but I certainly support what you're, you know, what you're doing. I'm really happy that we're able to go back and be able to do this. You know, they did help us at a time when we, you know, were struggling with the budget. And I you know we're really appreciative of what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. So we will move ahead and um, I know that they will be very grateful and appreciative of this. Mm -hmm. And I also think it speaks, bodes well for the future because if we would ever get in a situation like this again, at least they know that we were willing to make this move when we had the money to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And will this, will this be a surprise to them? Do they have any idea about this? No. Um, they, I had a discussion with them to let them know that I would be bringing this forward to the committee and to let them know how much I appreciated their help when we were in that tough spot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've done something similar too with the bus drivers, as far as, you know, the $2 temporary raise when we had the COVID money, you know, but if we have it, you know, we'd love to give them a lot more money, but, but when we get it, when we have it, we, 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 we give it back. Yeah. But Mike, just to be clear, so that was a that was an extra bump for the bus drivers at that time. This really isn't extra. This is just restoring what we had negotiated with them. I understood. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So next, I just want to share. You know, our food service director has just 
done a marvelous job writing grants and, and bringing in new items for the district. A lot of these grants cannot be used for food or for employees or for anything like that, but instead it's been used for equipment, um, refurbishing some of our, our kitchens. And the latest grant that he has received is for $45,000 and <coughs> purchasing a van for the food service. And this will help satellite food to uh, different spots. So we're in the process of working with the town and we'll be going out, possibly taking this to town meeting uh, just for the approval, but we will, we have the money for your grant to buy a new van. So I think that's great and really appreciate the money that um, he's been able to bring in. Um, next, I would like to share, I think you remember on January 21st, we had had a statement filed by Ellen Chambers of uh, Fedwatch, and it, he, she filed it against the district uh, with the Department of Education. The district had removed the language, um, and the language that she had filed the complaint on was the parent agrees to excuse the district from strict adherence to IEP timelines, which are difficult to pursue due to governmental directive arising from or related to COVID issues. And this was put into place when the COVID started just because everything had shut down and we were trying to make some accommodations and work with people. We did re we did use this language, but it's since been removed. We reported this to the department and I received a letter two days ago stating that they do not require any corrective action in this matter and the complaint has been closed. So I wanted to report that to the committee. Um, we received Title I numbers or poverty for the for next year. And really the poverty number is what Title I is figured upon. Fortunately or unfortunately, depend on how you look at it, Wareham has increased by four points. So we're now at 32.04 which means when they go to um, divvy out different funds, we're going to receive substantially more because our poverty level is higher. So we anticipate receiving more funds than what we've had in the past. Um, and finally, you know, working with the educators and the administrators um, and the town officials, what we've seen in the past probably three to four weeks is about a 20, 20 persons or so drop in the COVID numbers each week. So this past week, Wareham was at 44, which we are very happy about that we're seeing this consistent drop. We've also applied with the state, our nurses, that we can uh, uh, administer COVID testing to students and staff if need be. And once we receive the approval, then we're going to be purchasing some kits. Our nurses will go and receive the training and then we'll be able to administer any tests that we would need to. Again, if we were going to administer to students, it certainly would have parent permission attached to this. I know that there's a, a good possibility that there will be availability of the vaccine coming to Wareham in the very near future. And I've been assured by the Board of Health that our staff will be given ample opportunity to um, receive the vaccination if they so desire. We also, I also know that everyone, and I do mean everyone, teachers, um, administrators, all want our students back. And so for that reason, um, we've been in discussions with the WEA. We haven't come to any agreement about when that's going to occur. However, on March 8th is my intention to 
uh, return students to a longer school day. Today, Desi um, kind of changed the playing field on it because they changed the requirements on transportation and really removed any requirements that we would have to bind us um, in transporting our students. So there's no restrictions when we transport our elementary students from today forward, other than the fact that the windows need to be at two inches. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to forego the cleaning, et cetera, et cetera, but it does change how we look at transportation. They've also changed transportation for the middle school, high school. And unless you're in a high district or high community, then there are no restrictions for your high school or for your middle school. If you are in a high community, then your restriction is two students per seat. So that really changes how we transport our students to school. And that um, has been one of our drawbacks. And so as we plan to move forward, um, you know, I thought I had the plan that we were going to move forward with, and I was going to share it with you tonight, and we are going to start gradually and increase by several hours a day with, a, with the intent by April 22nd, we would be full day. Given the fact that DESE has changed how we operate, then I need to go back to the administrators and have conversation about how we're going to program with the understanding that we are moving on March 8th to extend our day. Whether we extend it to full day or whether we extend it to several hours more, I just need to have that conversation before I bring it back to the committee. It's my intent to bring this, the decision to the committee at the next meeting and ask for a vote. But please understand, we are moving forward, we are returning our students back to school, and it just depends on the time. It's also our goal to have our students at full days and at more days than two by the mid part of April. It truly given all factors, if they work in our favor, we would like to have our students back full time. I can't say that we're ready to do that at this point. I still need to have some conversations and work with the WEA, but that is our goal. So at the next meeting, I will have the uh, decision on the time that our day will be extended to beginning March 8th. And certainly would be asking for a vote of your support at that point. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Anyone have any questions? Did, Kevin? Did Desi have any new changes regarding uh, lunches or food uh, cafeteria yet. or anything like that? Um, not, they are going to come out with some other directives. They did change the directive today as well. And it is going to be three feet. So they have uh, left the six foot um, between students and now they've gone to the three foot. I can't say that we're going to alter our six foot, but they did have that change. They also said that there are going to be some additional changes coming in the very near future, especially since there's a new CDC director and that we should expect to hear from them in the next week or so. Okay, Mike. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out that uh, Miss Miss Kearns has a question. Um, okay, it's not usually customary at this point during the meeting to allow questions from the public as you know, Mike. Um, no, we changed that. It's at the discretion of the chair. Okay, so what I was just going to say is, Bridget, go ahead and type your question into the chat, if you don't mind. Mary, did you have something? No, just that, that um, 
you know, I, I totally get, you know, everybody wanting to have students back and um, I just, again, like I've, I've always had concerns as I've already, you know, have already said. Um, I think that it's important that we look at the numbers after the February vacation to see where we are before we determine, you know, what we should be doing for in-person. Um, and also uh, the other thing was about that. You know, I know that um, Ms. Kearns had brought up about the cleaning of the buses and all of that. And I, I just want to commend Wareham for, for doing that because I don't think other districts were, and that's where some of their numbers were going up. And that's the reason, you know, the district I'm in is probably had to go on full remote because of that. So again, I just want to commend the, the district for being cautious, that's all. Okay, thank you, Mary. Yeah. Um, so Kim, Bridget's question is why such a, um, slow approach to returning to full days and why are we not adding Wednesdays? Once again, we have an MOA that we're negotiating with the teachers and Wednesday is listed in the MOA. We're in the process of having discussions with our WEA and that will continue. As far as slow approach, I'm not really sure the slowness of it, but we do have to prepare and given the fact that Desi um, change some parameters on us today that will possibly change how we approach. And I will say that at any point we start to um, have more COVID cases, we will stop the expansion and go on hold. Because my goal is to keep everyone safe and healthy. Okay. Does that answer your question, Bridget? No, but that's what I can do right now. Um, Deanna, I see your question uh, about meeting remotely and no one would like this no meeting would like to be in person more than I would. Um, the, the reason that we are, the only reason that we are remote right now is because the building that we meet in is closed to the public. And so if we did choose to have our meeting there, um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to have anyone else in the room. We did have a couple of hybrid or at least one hybrid meeting and the technology was really choppy. Um, the members who were at home weren't able to see us um, and the meeting didn't run very smoothly. I've looked into or considered moving the meetings back to a school room, but of course the schools are also closed to the public school committee members have not been into the schools. And so um, we have not moved the meetings for that, for that reason to, to the schools. So that is the only reason why we're meeting remotely. Um, it's something that I'll continue to explore. And after vacation, uh, I was honestly hoping, I saw that the library was starting to open up, the town hall is starting to open up by appointment. So it's really my hope that that building will open back up and we'll be able to be meeting in person again. And as soon as we are able to, we will be. Um, go ahead, April. So just to, for people to understand at home, Kim, that the, um, those families that still feel that their children are at risk or their families are at risk or are still not comfortable, once we do um, have a plan and a solid date in place, they could still choose to either to stay remote or would they be able to do remote hybrid or in person full time or just remote and full time once the time comes? Um, they would certainly be able to stay remote. And as far as doing remote or hybrid and I, I don't think so, but that's something that we would have to work on. Thank you. Okay, Bridget, sorry, I tried to answer your question in the chat and I, I didn't. So if you're still there and you'd like to speak, yes, you can come on and speak.
Sorry, I'm trying to come back on. Um, it doesn't, I don't understand why we would go so slowly. We've obviously showed that the numbers are low. Um, and it just seems like if we're going to transition to more time, there's no reason to take an hour at a time and drag it out till mid April. It just seems like it would be appropriate to return the kids to full day school for those two full days that they're in. And we need to consider getting them back in on Wednesday. Um, I don't understand why we're taking this very gradual approach. It does not make sense to me. Um, and I, you need to explain it better because I don't feel like you're giving an adequate answer, Dr. Shaverhood. I don't have anything else to say. I've explained it and that I don't have anything else to say. So Bridget, I guess what I would say, I did explain that she will now be working on, on an actual plan. Um, which things have changed just over the, just today, things have changed. Um, there's been many conversations, including with the WEA, to make all of this happen. Um, so, we, so it doesn't seem to make sense because the changes that Jesse is making doesn't actually affect the duration of the day. So it changes the number of students or how close they can be to each other, but not the duration of the day. The full day being a, the bus barrier and the cleaning barrier is not an adequate answer. Um, other schools are capable of doing it. We are capable of doing it. Nothing in those guidelines says that there needs to be cleaning between the high school route and the elementary route. It just says be between the morning and afternoon routes. So this is doesn't seem necessary to me that we need to do this type of cleaning. I think it's um, time to get them back into full days. And I think that it's time that we need to um, get them back in the classroom on Wednesdays. Okay, thanks for sharing your opinion and we're going to continue to work on it. And I will be bringing a plan to the committee at the next school committee meeting for them to vote. on. It seems like a very slow process that there's a lot of talking, 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 planning, planning, planning and not actual any doing. Can I say something? Sure. So I'm just I'm just going to say that, you know, being in another school district where we've brought in the kids for full days and um, for whatnot, uh, we've had to go remote for most of the kids because of the high numbers that because it became high numbers and because probably they weren't being as careful as Wareham as being. So I'm, I'm just, again, going to commend Wareham for, for doing what they're doing because the numbers have been much lower and we are not, you know, having to, to do um, stop the in-person to do remote because, because of that. Are you confident that that's the reason that there's a difference? I because I'm, I not, I'm not confident that that's the reason. Um, there are a lot of factors I'm sure that go into that, including community spread and in-home spread. And it has been shown that there is very little transmission within the schools. The American we Academy of Pediatrics published a study last month in which the University of North Carolina looked at 100,000 staff and students. In that population, they found about 770 positive COVID cases. And of those positive cases, seven, 32, 32 were in school transmission and zero were from child to adult. So right now we have a lot of data that demonstrates that there's very little transmission in the school, meaning it's a very low risk of getting COVID in the school and teachers are at a very low risk of getting COVID from a student, if any. I'm not saying it cannot happen that a child cannot transmit to an adult, but what we are seeing is that it is very minimal to none and 32 students out of 100,000 is hardly any reason to shut down our school systems. Uh, one, one last comment, just one last comment and then I'll be quiet. Um, I'm gonna to have to disagree because I've had several principals say to me, don't ever let anyone tell you that it doesn't transmit in schools. That's my last comment. I'm just going with what the American Academy of Pediatrics study published. 
That's the data. The data has shown over and over that there is very little transmission in school. Okay, so what we've heard tonight is that the superintendent has committed to coming back to us with an actual plan of how this is gonna happen. Now I'm gonna take that as, as progress. Um, and you know, we're gonna look forward to the next meeting, which is only in two weeks and to, to what that plan is. Um, you know, I agree that you, we, the district, you, know, you talk about the busing, the district has worked very hard to keep the kids, the staff, everyone safe. And we've done, we've, they've done a very good job of that. And now is the time to move forward. And that's, that's what the superintendent has committed to do. So we, you know, we'll look forward to the next meeting. Go ahead, Kim. I just think that keeping our staff and our students safe is our priority. And I will not vary from that. Um, I think that everybody has worked very hard collectively to do that and to keep everyone safe. So regardless of whatever statistics you would like to share, we are going to stay the course and we are going to do the right thing for everyone. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think you used the right word, uh, Joyce. Um, progress is progress. Uh, up until now, it was, we were kind of in a holding pattern, and, and I was I was you know hearing from a lot of people sharing Ms. Kern's uh, concerns, and, um, and and not having any answers, and really, and um, and, and this this is it might not be as, as quick as we like, but 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 it's 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 prudent, and and, and you know we've been that's why I was that's why I was pretty dead set against bringing the kids back to sports because we have been doing so good until then why do why why have that risk so far it's worked out thank god but um but other than that the district's been doing very very well in a prudent fashion to um to 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 keep everyone safe and 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 hopefully bring bring kids back at, you know for more hours as we've heard the detrimental effects from our from our students at the last meetings you know that they 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 really really want to get back. I know the principals want them back. It's just it's just moving prudently mm -hmm. and safely, like everyone has yeah. said. Yeah, that's what, that's built in. <laughs> so we'll look forward to that next meeting. Thank you. Okay, so we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the superintendent goals for the. Um, for the next cycle, which we actually were, we're already in the middle of. Um, so everyone did receive the goals. Does anyone have any questions? So I guess I will say, so go ahead, Mike. Is it just pretty much the same as uh, last time? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I was I was looking to add one that just said, you know, try to get back to normal, but that's such a moving target. That's all. That's all I want is to get back to normal. <laughs> that's a lot of ask of one person, Mike. I know, I know. I'm not gonna not gonna add it, but that's that's that's, that's the frustration I have with all of this. I just want normal. Mm, we all. So I we did receive two versions of the goals. Um, we received one, and then you received a revised version, and that's. Um, that's the, because I had a, I had asked the superintendent to maybe um, add some, some measures um, that we, that we, something that we could use to measure the goals. So if you look at what she added, um, she did add a couple of goals, um, access and provide students with opportunities for additional academic assistance. And then on the next page, um, addressing capital needs and some of the specific capital needs. So those were some changes um, that were made. So does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask or? No? Um, another thing that I, I did bring up to the superintendent already is on the, um, the DESE evaluation form. We may have talked about this at the la during the last evaluation cycle. There are standards and there, then there are indicators. And as long as I've been a school committee member, we haven't identified these standards and indicators. So when we look at these evaluations, we're kind of looking at all of them. But it, there is a practice where a superintendent can identify the indicators that she would like to be evaluated on. We talked about this in our training. Mike, you're 
tilting your head like you. But oh, no, no, I, I agree. But I, I think it might have been tilting it. I mean, I think the superintendent and the school committee would have to agree. Well, right. So it's my understanding, like she would identify them and then we would have to agree to them. But in the same way that we would approve the goals, right? We would approve the goals and then approve the indicators also. Um, but with that said, I only just recently brought that up to her. So um, what I was hoping is that we could approve the goals or vote on the goals tonight. And then perhaps at a future time, because it wouldn't be necessary tonight, I don't think, unless someone disagrees with me, um, we could at, at a future date assign those indicators for the actual evaluation. So I guess I'm just looking for feedback from the rest of the committee on how you would feel about that. Dr. Schwamm? I just wanted to indicate that in the self-assessment, those indicators are, are mentioned under each of the standards with evidence in every self-assessment. So if you if you were to look at those, if you if everybody read that document, everything that had been done as related to those indicators is supported by evidence throughout the self-assessment. Do you see what I mean? I do see what you mean, but I think that I do see what you mean, but the in the self-assessment, those indicators are listed, but the committee isn't necessarily instructed that we're not looking at any of the other indicators. You know what I'm saying? Just trying to make it as I get it. possible. That's, I'm not trying to make it more difficult. I'm no, just no, 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 I, I totally get that. I think that it's just yeah. interesting because the, percep the, the way we look at it, even in our teacher evaluation and everything else, every single one of those indicators, we're looking at those constantly. It's just part of what we're supposed to do. It's part of how we are professional. And so when we respond or we write or the superintendent looks at those and she says, yep, I, you know, and we sort of go through each of those indicators mm -hmm. and there's evidence to support that, that that's happened. So limiting it might be nice actually, because then you would only have to write about that. Absolutely. Instead of all of the others. Mm -hmm. And they don't all apply to each goal. So all of the they kind of live in two separate, they're, two, they're separate and they are with the teacher evaluation too, which is rather interesting. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. the goals are sort of a reflection, personal kind of with the teachers. Mm -hmm. The standards and indicators are practice. What happens in the, in the day to day. Mm -hmm. So in that process for the teachers, it, it is separate, so to speak. And it, it's kind of interesting, right? Because you wonder how they're connected. And they are, but they're not really, you know, it's not a hit straight on. So, so I think I, it's an interesting dynamic if you took the goals and made them indicators rather than goals or called the, called the indicators goals, then yeah, I guess you could do it that way. Well, I guess what I was, what I was trying to accomplish was to assign indicators to goals. Yeah. Which is what you're saying you is done in the self-assessment? Correct. And I'm not implying that the committee, sh well, like Mike said, we wouldn't assign them, but we would approve them. So we right. would agree to what the superintendent. Um, Be a lot less writing for Kim, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm trying to make it more precise. Kevin, go ahead. I'm just going to say, uh, just based on previous experience in, in a couple, one other district anyway, that the superintendent limited uh, his or her goals, and that was also mirrored by the teachers had the same similar indicators, only seven or eight as opposed to 28, mm -hmm. just simplified the process, that's mm -hmm. all. Uh, and I think that might make it clearer for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's And that's all I'm trying to do. So I guess my question to the committee is, is does that is that okay? Is that, are you, is that, will that process, so we would vote on the goals tonight and then at a future meeting, we would, after the superintendent has assigned indicators to those goals, we would, we would review those at that time. I'm fine with that. Okay. Kevin, what do you think I'm about that? okay with that. Okay. Mary? 
Yeah, that that's okay with me. Okay. Mike, what do you think about that? Um, uh, can you repeat the last part of, of what you were suggesting? We would vote on the goals because she's submitted the goals to us. So we would, uh, you know, as we requested. So we would vote on the goals tonight. And then at a future time, we would, I guess, vote okay. to approve the indicators that she assigns to those goals. Uh, did you discuss this with her? Yep. Oh, okay. She's, she's on board with that? Yes. That's um, yeah. Okay. Uh, then, then, yeah. Okay. Um, Kim, certainly I'd love to hear what you have to say. No, I, that's fine. I, I think it would make it more precise and it would be easier for you to evaluate. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so if no one has any questions or changes to the goals that they'd like to suggest, I guess I would ask for a motion to approve the goals as presented. So moved. Second. We'll do a roll call vote, Mike. Yes. Mary? Yes. Yes. Kevin? Yes. April? Yes. And myself is yes. So five zero. Uh, um, the other, the other piece of the the, uh, the, the weighting of the goals. Uh, so right now, we use the um, the supplement to the DESI form, and that's where the goals are weighted. And it's far. I mean, in the last few years, we haven't made any changes to the weighting of the goals. But I just wanted to bring that subject up now in case anyone had any changes that they wanted to propose. If not, we'll leave it the way it is. I will. It's, it's currently what, 60, 40? You know what? I don't have the document in front of me. Can, can, can we revisit that when we do the indicators? Yes. Yeah, let's do that. Yes. Okay. All right. We will. Good idea. All right. Thank you. Um, April, I'm really sorry. I didn't see your hand and I just saw your message. Um, sorry, I have a lot of people on the screen. I'm, I'm sure, but it was more of a back to the, the previous topic and it was more of a, I've seen a lot of people on um, both social media and heard in person where uh, we're trying to compare ourselves to other districts. This, this town is doing that, that town is doing this. And just like it's hard to compare one child to another child, it's really hard to look at a neighboring town or other districts and know how many buildings that they have, how many students that they have, what kind of busing situation they have. Do they have private busing? Do they have um, a contracted busing system? Do their elementary schools have their own designated buses? Does their high school have a separate bus? So it's really hard, I think, to try to stay in that you know, comparison is the, the, the killer of joy, you know, so it, it's just, it's really difficult. We don't know what budgets that they're operating with. We don't know what other towns have when it comes to the percentage that they're getting from their town, from their budgets. We don't know what is happening. So comparing is it's apples to oranges in a lot of cases. And it's, it's really difficult. I don't think a lot of towns have two schools temporarily housed in one building. A lot of schools might not have the, um, the, the SPED population that we have. So there's so many other factors that go into keeping our staff and our students um, and the, their family safe. And whether or not it's been tracked to tracing you know, or contact happening in the schools, we nobody really know that 100 where they're getting anything from, and that's part of the the nature and the, the the what the scariest part of this whole pandemic has been is people are assuming where they got it from, and they're assuming where you know where that they picked it up, but nobody's really a hundred percent sure. So I think by taking their time, you know, a lot of families were really upset that their kids got suddenly thrust into remote learning last March because of the way things were forced to happen. And I think that if we don't take our time and we just thrust our kids back in another change in routine, kids operate the best when they do have a routine. And whether or not some families are having a harder time or not, this has been their routine 
since March or since September. So by suddenly thrusting them into another situation could also cause unrest, could cause disturbances, could cause emotional breakdowns for a lot of students. So we have to take so many things into consideration. And it's not that everyone's requests and opinions aren't being heard because we have so many varying opinions coming at us from parents, from teachers, from administrators, from the CDC, from DESE, from all of these outside sources. And I think that our district has done a really good job trying to look at the bigger picture and not trying to just smooth things over and make everybody happy. No matter what decisions that we make, someone is upset. And that's just unfortunately human nature. Not everyone is going to agree 100% of the time, but what we can agree on is that we are 100% trying to put the safety of our kids and our district and our staff and our community ahead of, of what other people are doing. It's like the jumping off a bridge you know, kind of thing. If somebody else is going to do it, are you going to do it too? And I like that we're taking our time to put the social, emotional well-being of our kids and not thrusting them so quickly into something, but doing it gradually, giving them time to wrap their heads around more change, because this year has been full of change for all of us. And I think us as adults, we've had a harder time adapting to those changes than the kids. Kids are resilient. You tell a kid what to do, they say, okay. They, they're rule followers. We've taught them to be rule followers because we've been good examples for them. So what examples are we showing by adults on social media or other aspects complaining and whining and showing them that if they're not going to get their way, they're going to stomp their feet and they're going to try to enact change. And people should try to enact change, but they also need to be patient so that the well-being of our kids stays our number one priority. Thank you, April. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the report of the school committee. Um, elementary school building project update. I did share with uh, the committee the um, presentation that we had at this week's building committee meeting. So I don't know if any, anybody had a chance to look at that, if anyone has any questions about that. Um, we did invite the project managers to come and give a presentation to the school committee. And that will happen, I believe, at our first meeting in March. Um, they will be here. I can't even imagine what progress will have been made by then. They're working so fast out there. Um, the community outreach group continues to do the monthly videos, uh, which they're getting a lot of views, a lot of, you know, they're answering questions. The project manager is on there live answering questions, which is great. Uh, they're doing the best that they can, you know, without being able to have groups of people um, out at the site. So we'll look forward to a presentation from, um, like I said, from the project manager at the beginning of March. Um, other than that, under the report of the school committee, I think under, uh, go ahead, Mike. Oh yeah, report of the school committee. Just wanted to mention the, um, the legislative breakfast. Uh, is anyone going? I plan to. Yes, yeah, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I unfortunately yeah. have a day of Clemson, I'm not going to be able to attend. Yeah, so so no, so just so you know, normally in the past, like pre-COVID, it was a it's a, it was a big deal that uh, the, the Cape Cod Collaborative puts on. Phil, Paul Hilton organizes and, and and legislators from all around show up to this thing and, and discuss all kinds of school issues. But um, but, but this time it's going to be through Zoom. So I, I'll make my own breakfast, I guess, and Zoom in. <laughs> Um, okay, and so also under school committee reports, uh, this, uh, this is when I'll bring up the letter. I did circulate a letter um, to the school committee that Kevin so graciously put together. Um, Kevin, do you have the letter in front of you? Any chance? I can probably get it up on my computer. Let me see. Oh, I, I was, was going to ask you to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can find it, just give me a second. Okay. So this is a letter that um, was drafted and will be from the whole school committee to the governor and to our legislators, um, encouraging them to move teachers ahead in the, in the vaccine line. Um, you know, there isn't much that we can do, but this is one thing that we can do is, is reach out to the governor. 
Yeah, I can. I don't have the entire letter here. I can uh, summarize it real quickly, but. Uh, no, well, that's all right. I can read it. I was just hoping not to be the one to read it. So it's not that long. So I'll go ahead. Dear Governor Baker, as elected town officials and of ensuring the safety and well being of our staff and students, we are asking that you and our state legislators allow our teachers, administrators, and school staff to receive the COVID 19 vaccine as part of phase one implementation. We all want our students to return to school as quickly and safely as possible. We believe the vaccination of our staff would be an important step in making this return possible. It would be safer for our dedicated teachers and other essential support workers, helpful for all of our students and beneficial for our parents and community. We realize that vaccine supplies are currently limited and that everyone is trying their best in unprecedented and difficult times. Still, we believe schools should be a priority. This truly is in the best interest of our students who have lost valuable educational opportunities for too long. Thank you for all the work you have done on behalf of the citizens of our state. Please assist our school staff members who have worked so diligently and courageously throughout this pandemic. So we just wanted to show our support um, to teachers and all school staff you know, who are waiting to get the vaccine, which is you know, an important step in getting back. Um, so it's not on the agenda for a vote, but I didn't wanna to wait till our next meeting for another two weeks. I wanted to get the letter out as soon as possible. So I guess at this point, I would just ask for consensus of the committee. If you would like to sign the letter, um, it, it's set up, it's ready to be signed and we'll go ahead and send it. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I like it. It's just one of those things where I scratch my head, like why did it even come to this? Why don't, why aren't educators on the top of the list <laughs> somewhere, you know? But um, it's, it's mind boggling, but uh, yeah. I mean, so would we have to like show up and sign it uh, at, at the central office? Um, well, I guess I'd reach out to, we'll figure out how to make that happen, yeah. Yeah. Mary? Aren't we in phase two now? I think so. We are already in phase two? Yes. I think so too. They changed, they changed, it was supposed to be teachers and they changed the eight, they just did the next age level. Oh, so it was okay. 75, I think. And then they have to get the 65. Right. And does it make sense to put in there that other states are putting educators as a priority? I don't know. Um, well, we could, but I guess we're just trying to be diplomatic. Yeah. So maybe for that reason. But we will change the language then um, to, to reflect that we're already into, in phase two. We'll change that language. Okay. Um, but I just think it was something, you know, that we could do that shows support for the teachers and the staff that, you know, we do. No, really absolutely. I mean, I think, I think we should have been in phase one. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So as long as everyone is in agreement, then I'll, um, Jamie, I'm sure will graciously change that letter for us and I'll get it printed out and I'll reach out to everyone about getting it signed as soon as we can and get it out. Does it say just teachers or does it say teachers and like school staff? Yeah, it's just, teachers, I, it says teachers just administration and school support staff. Yeah. Okay. As Who's long as the team? support staff is in there too, because it's like if you have all the teachers vaccinated and the custodians, the one doing all the cleaning and they're not on that list. Yeah, and, no, no, no. You know, we yeah, so I'm just clarifying. So I am in full support of, I, I agree. I don't know why anybody that has been um, on the forefront of people trying to get reopened isn't first. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, my dog is making a cameo. Um, so I don't know why, um, you know, teachers and uh, in other in industries that they're trying to get into, you know, reopening, why that isn't happening in the phasing with the vaccine, it boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will work on that. Um, is there any um, other business? Mike. All right. So um, as you probably heard um, or read, I've, I've decided not to seek re-election. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to basically read this, um, almost what I put out on social media and, and add some further comment. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone who has been asking me if I'm running for re-election to school committee this year and urging me to do so. 
Uh, thanks for all your support from the beginning and now, but I have decided not to run again. Uh, some of you may recall that my, that my first term was back in 2012 to 2015. I didn't run again back, back then either, and I feel the same way now. Uh, I'm not a career politician, even if only a volunteer. Uh, and I have added, I've added responsibilities now in my personal life that, that won't allow me the time needed in which the position and the students deserve. Uh, I do wish the best to whoever decides to run this year. All that is required is a sincere desire to put students first and the available, the, the, the available time to do so. Um, here's to hoping many of you answer that call and I'll be happy to sign your nomination papers if you do. And, um, you know, so, so I know you and I disagree on this choice, but, but three years is a long time uh, for, the, for this, it is. And, uh, and so just, 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 you know, we had this discussion kind of earlier, but I want to just kind of give you like, you know, uh, so, pe so people ask me, you know, when they, if they're thinking of running, you know, how much time does it take? How much time does it take? And, and I, guess, I always say it kind of depends on what you, what you want to put into it, you know, but, but you know, the, I, I, I like going to all the other meetings. I like going to the FinCon meetings and all these other, you know, anytime school's being discussed and stuff, you know, but even the, just this, this is like this month and last month happened to kind of be the same as far as like the schedule. And, and so, so this, this week, uh, I, I've got a school committee meeting, we got the building committee meeting, we got the policy review committee meeting, <laughs> and the Cape Cod collaborative meeting. <laughs> and and by the, oh by the way, whoever whoever ends up on that is basically being on another school committee. It, it, it's it's a full blown agenda. It's a long meeting. Well, it's worth it. it. It's interesting. It's great. It's great people. But 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 I I, I actually couldn't even make that. That was last night. And I, I was stuck at work and I couldn't I, I couldn't do it. Um, so I had to call and let them know. But that happened last month too, coincidentally. Um, but anyway, so, so it, it is, um, it is a big commitment. Um, and, and I've got way too much going on at work <laughs> right now and other stuff, but, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, um, you know, I love, I love working with, with the, with the, the, you know, the students and the principals and the teachers and, you know, the administration and, and, and I'm, I'm going to miss it. No doubt, you know, um, but, um, I, I wished well to whoever does run and, and um, and, and thank you for your service in advance. Well, I'm sure we will still be seeing lots of you, Mike. Well, yeah, I'll still be on the building committee. So, so there's that, you know. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and if there's no other business, we'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call vote, Mike. Uh, yes. Mary? Yes. April? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And myself, yes. Well, five zero zero. Thank you, everyone.